to read. Jesus walked with his disciples for three years. Three years he began to teach them. Three years they followed him. There were a total of twelve disciples. But his disciples were separated into two categories. You had the one category, which was three. You had Peter, James, and John. They were in the inner circle of Jesus. In other words, they got to spend more time with him than the others. The others were in the outer circle of disciples. Even though they were twelve disciples, all of them were not of equal status. And I stopped to ponder, why is it that three got to be closer to Jesus and the other nine did not? I remember there when they were arguing one time and, and their argument went like this. Uh, would you allow me to be on the right hand of you? They were trying to find out which one was going to be the greatest among them. And so much so that the mother of two of them decided to come to Jesus and say, Would you allow my sons to one sit at your right hand and the other one to sit at your left hand? You know, we always are trying to consider how we can get status. They understood who Jesus was, but their understanding was limited because all they wanted was more authority. When we deal with anointing, you find that there are people in line for authority. Authority comes from that which authored it. The writer of the book is the one who gives the authorship. He gives us the authority. But he is not trying to give us authority to just have authority. Everyone that's hearing this message wants authority. Everyone that's hearing this message wants power. Everyone that's hearing this message wants respect. We all want that. But in truth, Jesus answered and told his disciples, He that must be great must first be little. You want to be great in God, you must become nothing. We find that the biggest struggle that we have in church today is getting to the point of nothingness. You know, I grew up in a house where education was very important. The moment that my father see a gift in me, he wants to send me to school. <laughs> Why does he want me to get educated? Not for me, because I already did it. For him. He wants to be able to say, look at my son. In other words, he wants to get credit for me. He doesn't want cr credit that I get credit for myself. He wants credit for him. So he can look like a good father. See, God is a good father. But he's not out trying to get credit. He sent his son to become nothing. So while he became nothing, he became all things. Acts chapter 2, starting on verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly they sound like that of blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the birth of what we consider to be the Pentecostal movement because it began in the day of Pentecost. It was 40 days after the ascension of Jesus. It was a holiday that people came and left their the countries where they live. If they were native Israeli, native Jews, they will come to Israel to celebrate the day of Pentecost. Now I did tell you about Jesus' inner circle history. Then his outer circle was the twelve. But it didn't stop at twelve. He had another group which numbered seventy. So he had three different groups. He had the three he had the twelve. He had the seventy. Now, while they were sitting up in this upper room, it was not the three. It was not the twelve. It was the seventy. Do you know we have a harder time worshiping God in one accord when there's more of us? 
we have a hard time letting go our own self and our own ideas to just come together and just worship God. I know what I'm talking about. I've been doing this for quite a while. You know, when we have praise and worship just to tell the people, come on, praise, you still have a whole group that just sits there like a bump on a log. They are unmovable. You know, we want power from God, but we want to be stubborn and do it our own way. We want to enter into His presence under our own restrictions. We want to tell God how to be God even in worship. Understand that how we worship today is nothing like how worship was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you were not able to come and worship God if you were sick. You couldn't come to the temple. You had to stay outside. If you were a eunuch, you could never come to the temple. You always had to go worship with the women. Women were not allowed in the temple. Come on, I'm preaching already. If you had acne problem, you couldn't come worship in the temple. There were restrictions for who can come in and who couldn't come in. Imagine that you traveled for days to come to the temple and you happened to get an acne before coming in the door. And you had ushers to usher you out. Not only that, you could not come empty-handed. How many people come to church today empty-handed? Everybody had to take part in worship. You didn't have a choice. When everybody got up, you got up. Do you know you had to memorize certain prayers? Barukata Adonai. Elohim, you had to be able to say the prayers in the native tongue. In Hebrew, the idea of worship was corporate. The idea of worship was not singular. You know how we do it today? We hire people to put on a show. We fire people when the people are not responding to their show. Hey, I was in that industry for 25 years. I can tell you, I can make people shout. I know all the right tunes to hit, all the right movements to make. I mean, I can cue uh, uh, a person to shout, start shouting at the right time and start playing. And do the little back thing. I mean, you, you got it all queued up. And people leave, we had church. No, you didn't. You didn't have church. That's not what church is. You know what church is? I am. I am church. You are church. When we come together, that's we have church. The word church is in the original language is ecclesia. Ecclesia is the coming together. Not the building. Not the sound. Not the praise and worship team. The coming together makes us who we are. We are the church. We come together. So in the upper room, you had the 70. They came together for one purpose. The, in the King James Version, it says they, they were in one accord. I like that word because it's a musical term. Chord comes from music. When you play a chord, then you're playing more than one note. It's normally at least three. And when you play those notes, they come together. And they make a pretty sound. You have one that's harmony. And you have two that's, uh, you, two that's harmony and one that's melody. Sometimes you can add to the chord, and you can do a C7, and add 1, 3, 5, and 7. You can go and add a ninth. You can go ahead and add an eleventh. You can continue to build on your chord, but it's still a chord. You're playing one chord, having many different sounds. But you want to play notes that come together and sound good. See, as a musician, I can tell you there are different type of chords. There are chords that actually sound bad when you play them together, that are played purposely. You know, but they are not played for you, for you to stay on the discord. It is played so you can move on to a chord. You play a discord, and you'll hear that dissonance, and your ear will go like, Ugh! and then all of a sudden you transition to the note that you want it to end, and, and it sounds like this. Ah! Oh, wow. And you want to hear that. There's a lot of dissonance in church.
But the problem is we don't know how to resolve. How do we resolve dissonance? This is how dissonance is resolved in every culture. Forget yourself. You want to stop an argument? Do you know? I mean, I'm married. I know how to start an argument. I mean, I can start an argument real quick with my wife. I know her buttons, and she knows mine. I press that button, and she reacts to the button. Sometimes I press that button unwillingly. Then she reacts, and I have to turn and say, I'm not trying to fight. You notice it was a discord that all of a sudden resolved. Because, you know, she all of a sudden put that wall up, and yeah, no, I'm not trying to fight. We're not having a fight here. You know, I'm just saying a statement. If I ever want to not fight, I must be good at not getting my way. I got to remember, you know, I'm not always getting my way. God did not call me, and he didn't save me for me to get my way. In all honesty, God called you and saved you so you could do it his way. You don't get your way. It's God's way. Now, why are we starting with the Holy Spirit here? Do you know that if they got together on the day of Pentecost and could not come into one accord, that wouldn't have uh, ushered the Spirit of God to come in. There was one time in the military of Joshua. God instructed Joshua, you're going to go into the city and you're going to totally destroy everything. The silver and the gold is mine. Everything else, kill it. Kill everything. The silver and gold is mine. Everything else, destroy it. Completely decimate everything. Simple instructions, right? Do you know someone went in there and he saw some stuff and he said, this is nice. I'm going to take it. Nobody will know. He took it. And the Bible says he hid it with his stuff. You know the word stuff is in the Bible? Stuff. He hid it with his stuff. And all of a sudden they went and fight against a little city called Ai. The, little, the city was so small that they came together and they said, Listen, this is a small city. Let's not even bother. Let's just send a little bit of our troops there because there are not a lot of folks. And, you know, we'll destroy AI and we'll be back for lunch. <laughs> and a small group goes to AI and comes back running. The soldiers in AI will whoop in their butts. For the very first time, Israel lost. Not only did they lose, they lost against a weak people. See, what happened when we fail to come together as a body of Christ, we start to fail over weak things. Things that we normally would whoop easily start whooping us because we haven't learned to come together. We're stubborn. We come to church and I don't feel like it. Who asked you? Do you know I don't feel like it? Do you know there's times I got to fr- preach that I'm like, I wish someone else would preach for me. I don't feel like it. There's times I got to pray. I don't feel like it. There's time I got to praise. I don't feel like it. But you know, God didn't call me to, to worship Him when I felt like it. He called me to worship Him at all times. I'm supposed to have praise all times. Not just when I feel like it. So here they are whooped by Ai. And Joshua said there's sin in the camp. He went he said alright we're going to choose from which tribe it came from. They got a tribe. Alright we're going to choose from which clan it came from. They got a clan. Alright we're going to choose from what family it came from. They got a family. You know what was the result of Achan Taking some stuff. Achan. Achan's wife. 
Aiken's children were all killed for not coming in one accord. We have to learn to come in one accord. So now, here they are in the upper room, and here comes a mighty rushing wind. You know, it is my hope that one day I'll get to experience what it is to have a mighty rushing wind come into our service. It is my desire to, oh, if God did it, God can do it again. I want, I want to hear a mighty rushing wind come from heaven and hit our, our place where we're having service. I want to see tongues of fire upon people's heads. You know why we haven't gotten that? In all honesty, in all my life, we've never had one service where everybody came together for the purpose of glorifying God. Never. You know why most people come to church today? Because they have to. It's been imposed upon them by their parents that they go to church, so now it's in them. I got to go to church. I was raised this way. I got to go. So they just go. And they look at the time the whole time they're going. Oh, he's just talking too long. When are we going to go home? You know this past, so last Sunday I got to preach at a church and, and I preached 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 and I kept on preaching. And, you know, and I was waiting for someone to get up. I got to go. You're just preaching too long. They knew it was the last time I was going to be there for at least the next six months. So five hours later, we finished. Now, honestly, how many of you paused right there when I said five hours? You know why they came to service? To hear the Word of God. You know what they got? The Word of God. They didn't complain at any time that, oh, he's taking too long. I'm sure when they got home, they're like, okay, we've got to rush this and this and this because we were at church a long time. But guess what? I ministered a long time. But yet even there, not everybody was in one accord. There were some people that wanted to go home. There were some people who came because they had to. See, even those who are listening, they may not be able to go to a church and probably that's why they're looking at us over the internet. I realize that we, we are one body. We can come in accord in different places at different times and still be in accord. I want the Holy Spirit to move in this place. You know why I want the Holy Spirit to move in this place? Because the Holy Spirit came to give us one thing. One thing He came to give us. And that one thing is power. I want us to be moved in power. I want the members of our church to be invited in other places and minister in power. I don't want to hold them back. I want them to go. I want them to have the experience of going out and you minister and you see God work through you. I want to, I want you to have that experience. I don't want to be no super pastor of no super church. But God didn't call me for that. Jesus made sure that he wasn't going to be no super pastor having no super church. Do you notice that when he did great miracles, he would tell them, shh, don't tell nobody? What do we do? We publicize it. It's going to be on the commercial. You seen those commercials? I'm going to tell you what they look like. Wheelchairs all empty sitting there. Why is it after service the pastor is going to say, all you that got healed from, from uh, your wheelchair, I need your wheelchairs. Put them there. Isn't that kind of nonsense? I've gone to churches where they've had crutches hanging from the front of a, uh, the, the church. Just sitting up there on the wall, crutches. The one time that God healed somebody. We can still remember, look, look at the crutches. Making a God out of it. We want to be able to minister in power. But there is no minister in power if we have discord. God does not move in mess. Do you notice that when God, when you open Genesis chapter 1, there was a mess? Did you notice that? And the whole earth was what? 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, what did the Spirit of God do? Clean up house. You notice that what that's what the Holy Spirit did. It cleaned up house. It began to move. And when it began to move, things started getting in order. When God spoke, everything He spoke happened. Well, why? Because there was this order before. Do you want God to come and speak into this house to make you be right? Well, I don't think you want that. Honestly, you, if you read your Bible, if you ask God to fix up something that you're messing up, God will fix it. But you're not going to like it. <laughs> it is better that you fix it yourself. You begin to work on those areas that you need. That when you come together, your mind is not going all over the place. That you're not sitting there thinking, okay, I've got to do this and do this and do this. And when he finished, I've got to do the other. And I, no, we've got to have a moment of, okay, I'm focused, I'm paying attention. We are coming together as one people. I come from the Republic of Panama. My wife comes from the Dominican Republic. We're from two different countries. We have some similarities, but we have some some areas that we are distinctly different. For instance, Dominicans are not very confrontational. There's a problem, they're not going to tell you. They're going to tell somebody else. You may hear from someone else the problem that you're having with that person. Panamanians are confrontational. We get right in your face and tell you how we feel and feel that you need to get over it. We are like that by nature. Well, what happens when you're a pastor and you're a Panamanian, you're confrontational? You know, I've had to learn, Ronaldo, keep your opinion to yourself. No one asked you. Be quiet. When it gets really serious, Ronaldo, shut up. You know, I, I end up having to encourage myself in the Lord. The Bible tells us to do that. So there are times I'm about to burst, and inside of me I'm like, be still, be quiet, because, you know, I'm Panamanian. But do you know what trumps being Panamanian? I'm a son of God. That trumps being Panamanian. You know, I'm supposed to have character of God more than I'm supposed to have character of being Panamanian. My wife's supposed to have character of God more so than she should have character of being Dominican. So we can go through the house in here and say, well, Annie has to have more character of God than having character of being Haitian. That Chris and, and, and Justin need to have more character of God than having character of being Caucasian American. See, character of God is more important than where I came from. So there's certain things about me but God begins to change. So when I compare myself to where I came from and where I am, this should be a journey apart. It should be I've walked a long ways. It should almost be that that one that started the journey, it's not recognized by the one who continued. In your own walk, is that how it is? Can you look back at your former self and say, Wow. Man, I was really messed up back then. See, you know what happened? We get a lot of people who, they weren't really sinners. We got categories of sinners, you know. It's not biblical, by the way. I can stop you right there. You can't find it in the Bible. They're not categories of sinners. You're either a sinner or you're not. But we have categories of sinners. I wasn't that bad. How many of you? here understand what I'm talking about. You categorize yourself. I wasn't that bad. When I got saved, you know, I didn't kill nobody. You know, I, I wasn't a thief. You know, I I wasn't an extortionist. I wasn't a liar. You know, I did my little things, but I wasn't that bad. Not that bad would have, if you died in that condition, you were still gone. You were gone to hell. Something that pastors try not to say anymore, going to hell. We need the Holy Spirit for this. I need power to get over me. Our biggest problem is not demons. Hear me, because I'm telling you the truth. 
Your biggest problem is not no devil. We give glory to demons for stuff that we need to get right. James chapter 1 says, Let no one say that he is tempted by God, for God cannot tempt no one. But we are tempted when we are drawn by our own lust and enticed. You're tempted when what? You're drawn by that thing that you want. So who is tempting you after all? You are tempting your own self. Is there demonic power involved in there? Yes. You're tempted by your own desires. And then he does the enticing. Who started the temptation? You did. Let me explain it. Got to say in simple terms. Because I want everybody to get it. Guys, you see a fine looking woman. And you see her. And then you looked for a little too long. Now, is it your desire already? Yeah, it is because it's ingrained in us to desire the opposite sex. It is. Is it that a bad desire? No. If it was a bad desire, we would never get married. We'll never have children. It's a good thing that we desire the opposite sex. It's a bad thing when we desire the same sex. It's a good thing when we desire the opposite sex. But there comes a line to where we start to cross. I looked at her. I desired her. I looked away. I forgot her. That's okay. There was no sin in that. But when it becomes sin is this. I looked at her. I desired her. And the enemy says, I know you're married. But nobody will know. You know, she already likes you. You see how she looks at you when you breathe? And I start to entertain that. Instead of rebuking it, I start to entertain it. You're right. Man, how can we do this? How can I do it? Nobody knows. And you know the Bible says that you then become pregnant. You become pregnant with that. What does that mean? It's now forming inside of you. Now do you know while it's forming inside of you, it's still not sin? You got time to stop it. You do. It's forming inside of you, and you know I haven't done anything yet. I haven't done it. Stop! 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 You're okay, but what happened? If you continue, then you give birth to it. You give birth to sin. When you give birth to sin, you've sinned. What did it start with? Me. How do I not get it to go that far? I need to work on. Me. Me up here, I still mess up at times. Me wants stuff that me does. And I'm glad that before it comes to be full birth, it stopped. But you know, I'm just as gullible at times as everybody else. I go through the, through the lying to my own self phase. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? You sit there and, oh, well, you know, I'm stronger than that. You know, it can't happen to me. And you're, you're already involved. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit comes to give us power. So I, to, to, if you got saved, you, you already have the Holy Spirit. I know we teach that being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. But the moment you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. You may not be full with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to really blow you out the water to know, let you know that according to Scripture, we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. i got to continually look for God to refill me again. Because just like a gas tank, you drive, you're going to need more gas. I need to have more authority, more power. For what? To get over me. See, we are stuck on, I want to minister, I want to go and pray, and I want them to fall out, and I, I, I want to be able to speak in tongues, and I want to prophesy. And I, you know what you got to do first? Just like any other person before you, get over you. 
How do we want something that we don't have for our own self? I need power to get over me. I get in the way. When God wants me to pray, you know, and I want to sleep, you know who usually wins? Me. That's a shame, isn't it? When God wants me to get into the Word and study and I don't feel like it, you know who usually wins? Me. When God wants me to fast so I can get this body under subjection and I don't feel like fasting because I'm hungry, you know who usually wins? Me. And then I get up there and I can be very religious and say, I am a slave to Christ. No, I'm not. If you're a slave, you do what your master says. Whenever your master says it. Do you know that the female slave had no power over even her own body? If the master wanted to lay down with her, she would lay down and let him. She didn't even have that authority. She even had to get to the point of, okay, if you want to be intimate with me, I belong to you. How about if we can do that with God? Come on, I'm preaching now. How about if I can get with God that God, even at the point of intimacy, I don't hold back. I'm yours. No, I am not saying for you to be having sex with people in church. Get out of the gutter. I'm talking about spiritual things. That if God wants to spend time with me where it feels intimate, spirit to spirit, that I don't resist God. If I really want them, I need to act like I want them at home. We can all do it in church, which we don't even get that. That shows me you don't do it at home. Because if you can't even do it at church, you're certainly not going to do it at home. We need to get some time with God where God can interrupt us. We need to give God permission. God, interrupt me at any time, anywhere, whenever you want to. God, if you stop me on I-20, I will pull over and I would listen. Do you know one time I was leaving from the army? I was 21 years old. My younger brother had spent a few days with me before I got out of the army. He was a teenager at the time. We were driving back home to Miami so I can drop him off. I was driving a little Hyundai Scoop, a little sports car, two-door. Love my little Hyundai Scoop. You know, I had my sunroof, and, you know, I had what anyone in my age would think a cool car, even though it was a Hyundai. <laughs> and I began to pray while I was driving him home at nighttime. And then next thing I know, his hand is hovering over the steering wheel. I looked at him, I said, what's wrong with you? Why is your hand over the steering wheel like that, and why are you afraid? Why are you looking like that? What happened? He says, Ray, you began to pray. I said, yeah, I prayed for a few seconds. No, Ray, you didn't pray for a few seconds. You closed your eyes while you were driving, and you prayed for hours, and you didn't open your eyes. And we were driving in the back street. We weren't on the highway. We were driving a back street where you're going down the hill, and at the bottom of the hill, there's nothing but rocks. You had to turn. I didn't know. Guess what? I didn't drive. Because I thought I'd just close my eyes and say a few little things and open my eyes. You know, I'm going to be a safe driver. I didn't know God was going to take me up. You know what that was experience was for? It was for my younger brother. Because if he weren't there, I wouldn't have known it. I had no clue that I'd been praying for hours. Well, why did you do such a craziness? I felt this urge to pray. And, I, you know, and I thought, well, you know, it's not going to be long. I know how to say short prayers. I know how to get to the point. I'm not the religious one to sit there, thou who are holy and just, uh, who are magnificent above. No, I know how to say it really, really fast. Hi, God, I need you. I didn't know I prayed for a long time. 
I said, did you understand what I was praying? No, Ray. He was speaking in tongues. Didn't know a thing you said. All I knew is I kept seeing rocks in front of us. And then you would stare. You were going to speed limit. You were driving perfect for hours with your eyes closed. How about you gave God permission enough that He knows you enough that He can interrupt you enough that He can do the driving for you so you can spend some time with Him. I know this sounds a little up out there. I'm not trying to make you think that I'm greater than anything else because I'm not. I'm just as human as you are. But I am not a limiting God to me. I want God to be greater in me than anything I could ever imagine. I don't want God to be the God of the box. Because we do that. I've listened, we, yesterday we had a function and I listened to some people's conversation and I heard this, I will never and never is a forever word I don't use that word no more in my vocabulary because I know this God likes that word God likes to break my will so I can be subject to his will so I would say I would hope that I won't do that. But when I say never, it's automatically like, uh-huh, God's going to work on you now. Because you said you will never. I remember saying a few nevers. I remember saying I will never, ever, ever, under no circumstances, come back to Aniston, Alabama. Never! I live in Aniston, Alabama. I said, well, there's nothing in Aniston, Alabama. I live in Miami, Florida. I can find anything at any time in Miami, Florida. I mean, you can be at 3 o'clock in the morning, and if you're hungry, you'll find a restaurant that's open for the type of food you want to eat. Alabama, I lived here when everything was closed at 8 o'clock. Everything closed at 8 o'clock. There was nothing open at 8 o'clock. I was here when I was 18 years old. Drive down, it's 10 o'clock. You see the lights is blinking. There are no cars on the street. I came from a metropolis, from Miami, Florida. At 10 o'clock, there's still rush hour traffic. I said, what in the world? God, what hole did you put me in? It was God's intent. To break my never. How many nevers have you already said that God already broke? <laughs> See, God wants to use me. But to use me, He has to break me and mold me. God told this to a prophet in the Old Testament. He says, I need you to go down and watch a master work with clay. And he began to watch the master work with clay. And he began to watch how the master molded the clay with his hands on the potting wheel. And for some reason or another, it seems like the master messed up. Because all of a sudden, the master has to start back over again. But you know what he does with that clay? He doesn't grab the clay and throw it away and say, Oh man, give me a whole new lump of clay. No, what he does, he stops and he squishes it down back to a ball. Back down to how he started. And he begins to again mold that clay. He is the master. And we are the clay. It is his right to break us down to how we started and again begin to mold us again. Because I am clay. I am in every part of the aspect. I was made from the same substance that clay comes from. He has the right to mold me. And I don't get to complain when I'm in the furnace already with a form that he wanted me to have and he turns up the heat. Do you 
you know what happens to clay that is set in the heat with bubbles of air still in it? It burst. Do you know that once God puts you in the fire, if you crack, you are no good anymore. As long as you were still clay, you can still be molded. But once you're in that fire, you're stuck. Your substance is now changed. You don't get to grow a certain place in God and then turn around and say, forget it. And then come back again and say, start over. You don't get to do that. Some of you have been in the fire. You don't get to turn back to being clay. Now you got to go to the next phase. Let me get out of the fire, God. And when I'm on the fire, take off my roughness. <laughs> you know how they take off the roughness on that which they take out of a kiln? They're knives that are made just to scrape off the roughness. That's why some of you feel the cutting. God, you're cutting into me. God's taking off the roughness. We need the Holy Spirit to get over our own selves. I need the Holy Spirit to get over my own self. First Corinthians chapter 13 says this, And I'm going to know Him as I am fully known. I'm going to know God as I fully know myself. So I need to know who I am and who I am not. Most people that I meet throughout my life have been fakes. They don't. They have no clue who they are. They'll sit there. Who are you? I'm so and so and so and so. Who are you? I'm doctor. No, you're not. Who are you? Well, I am doctor. No, you're not. That is your profession. Who are you? Well, I am pastor. No, you're not. You pastor a flock. Who are you? I am bishop. No, you're not. You oversee pastors. Who are you? Can you stop and tell me who are you? You know, most people can. They associate their title to be who they are. I'm a wife. No, you're not. I'm a mother. No, you're not. That's not who you are. That's what you do. You know, if I went around and asked people in here who they are, you, you'd be surprised. Most of you here would have no clue what to answer. Because it takes a lot of contemplating to know your own self. A famous author said this, To thy own self be true. Stop lying to yourself. Find out who you really are. I'll give you a hint how you find out. You start asking God. Last time I asked God who I was, you know what he showed me? He put me, put me in one word. Could you imagine God describe you with one word? One word. He says, you are conceited. I didn't like knowing myself like that. I said, God, help me change. Went to Miami and was surrounded with prophets. And they began to try to find who I was. And they came back and said, one word. Three different prophets said the same thing. They said, you are humble. I like that. God can get glory out of humble. Let's learn who we are. And let's stop being so stubborn. Be quick to change. Be quick to be transformed. I like that word because it's going from one thing to another thing by the renewing of your mind. 
Be transformed by making your mind new again. Old stuff out, new stuff in. I want God to work in this ministry like He's never done before. I want that I don't have to be here all the time for people to have prayer. For people to come up and, listen, Bishop's not here today, I'm preaching. Come on, we're going to get together. I, I want that to where I don't have to say, you are doing this and you are doing the other and you are doing this. No, I, I want to where I know that the ones who are here, God can already use. I love one thing about the Japanese that I discovered the first time I went. Japanese considered to themselves, themselves, stay with me because this is very important. Japanese considered themselves to be of not much intelligence. You let that sink for a little bit, right? How do we think of Asian people? Smart. I mean, as long as you're Asian, you have to be good at math. You got to be a good at science. You know, you got you got to, because you're Asian, it's in your blood. You just got, and I get to where they are, and they say, no, we're not very smart. We're kind of dumb people. Wait, I didn't say that. That's what they told me. That's still not my view of them. They say that's why we have to send our youth to every country to learn from their countries so they can come back and bring to us because we're not very smart. And I'm looking at them from an outsider looking in. And I said, that is humility. That's why you are the smartest. Because you never pretend to know it all. You go out to bring it in. But when you bring it in, you brought in Germany. You brought in Spain. You brought in Italy. You brought in uh, Greece. You brought in Cuba. You brought in Puerto Rico. You brought in Brazil. You brought, I mean, you brought every nation's education together into one educated people, which do not make and invent anything themselves. Oh, goodness. Are you paying attention to me? Japanese do not invent anything. They just make it better. You see, the VCR you have at home was invented by RCA in the United States of America. It was huge. You had to put the disc from the top. Only companies could afford to buy it. It was so expensive. So RCA threw it out. Japan got a hold of it and said, let's make it better. Let's make it that every house can afford one. And they did. They don't invent things. They get your education to make it better. How about if we in church can have a mindset like that? And God, I am nothing. I'm God, I'm the dummy. God, I'm the one that needs of you. God, you know how I'm slow to learn. God, can you teach me? Do you know when we go before Father with humility, He always answers back? We don't usually go to God with humility. We go with God with God I want, I want, I want, I want. And then we go with to God with I don't want to do this and I don't want to do the other. And Why are you making me go through this? Why, God, you said that you'll give me and I'm having to go through. See, that's attitude. We need to fix our attitude. Come to God with the idea of knowing that whatever you're going through, he has the right to make you go through it. You lost your job, it is his right to take your job away. You lost someone in the family, it is his right to allow them to be taken. Everything that you go through, it is God's right, for he made you, not you, made yourself. How dare you tell God how he's supposed to do his work? How would you do if you were God for one day? <laughs> I thank God for what he's doing in this ministry. I thank God because everyone in here will get to the point that when they see something wrong, they're going to first question themselves before they question someone else. Everyone will be, what 
could I have done to make it better? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you sent forth the Holy Spirit. Lord God, you empowered us. Just as you did with Peter, the little wimp that ran away and said that he did not know Jesus and even began to curse when he said that his speech gave him away. But that same little wimp gets up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to speak to these thousands of people and say, we are not drunk as you suppose. God, we thank you that because of that boldness that came in him, 3,000 were added to the kingdom in that day. Lord God, how much more will be added to the kingdom today if we forget ourselves and just be bold under the anointing of the Holy Spirit? God, we thank you for this word, and we thank you for what you're going to say next concerning the same word which came forth today. We ask you, Lord God, to bless everyone who gave time from their own house to be part of this ministry this morning. Those even who are listening over the internet, Lord God, let blessing come forth because of the word that they heard. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.